Welcome to the preaching ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. Pastor Baker is fulfilling the call of God on his life to preach the truth of God's Word without compromise, raising up disciples who through faith in God will have a powerful impact on our world. May you be blessed through the message that Pastor Baker has to share with you today. May God's very best be yours. Romans 5. Come on, Romans 5. Back to our foundation verse. We're talking about training to reign. Training to reign. Let me read this foundation verse for you and explain what we've been teaching you about how to reign in this life. And it takes training. Verse 17. For if by one man's offense, Adam, when he sinned, he brought death. If by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, Adam, much more those who receive. Who what? Receive, make as their own, walk in revelation of the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. Notice the next statement. It's an absolute. Will reign in life. If I'm not reigning in life, I have not, I have not taken into my heart and got revelation on my own of the abundance of God's grace and or the gift of righteousness. Because if I'll do that, what did he just say? He didn't say you might. He didn't say 10 years down the road, 100 years down the road, you'll be gone by then. You will reign Amen. in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, let me review real quick with you. Two key things we've got to learn about here. We've got to take into our heart as our own all abundance of grace, all that grace gives to us, all that grace teaches us. All right? There's saving grace, right? And saving grace is something you're to God if you're born again. Now, that's what most of the grace teachers are talking about today, which is good. We need to know about saving grace. But once you're saved, now you can get more grace we talked about. Remember, James 4, there's more grace available. There's more grace available to the humble. And he was writing to believers. James wasn't writing to sinners. There's more grace. There's more of heaven's help available beyond saving grace. People get the picture, grace is all about, I do nothing, God does everything. No. No, you did nothing to earn your salvation in the context of your own effort, but your faith received what Jesus did for you. I like a better amen. amen. Now it's kind of like I sit back and do nothing because grace just goes to work. No, it don't. There's grace to be added to your life. Book of James chapter 4. I can't re-preach it all. But he literally said, God gives more grace to the humble, but he's opposed to the proud. Then he tells you how to be humble. And he goes right into telling you how to receive more of this grace. Because Titus 2, 10 and 11 said, grace to the believer is given to teach you. So there's more than saving grace. Grace is given to teach us to deny all ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Could I get an amen? So if we don't go by any, any preacher telling us, including me, what we think grace is and we just read the Bible, James says the, the way you get more of this grace is humility. Right. right? God gives more grace to the humble. What did he say? There's five things he then said. Uh, obviously reveal whether you're humble or not. Number one, submit to God. That's something you have to do. Submission isn't automatic because you got born again. If I'm humble, I'm going to submit to God. Meaning what? I'm going to obey His Word. He's smarter than me. He's trying to help me. He's trying to help my life. I can get born again and keep living like an absolute total pagan in my finances and God's grace is not going to show up in my finances because I'm born again. Right? I have to submit to what God says about my finances. I can be born again, have the love of God in me, but continue to not walk in that love towards other people. Not submit to what the Bible said. Love one another as I have loved you. But I choose not to do it. I choose to harbor you know, bitterness and anger towards you and treat you obviously like I treated people when I was a carnal fleshly sinner. I have a word for you. God's grace is not going to help you in that area of your life. You're not submitting to God. You have to submit to God. I'm just quoting James 4. If you hadn't heard it, we already taught all this. So you need to go back and get these teachings, but it's very simple. If I want, I got to receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. I'm going to get to the gift of righteousness today. But to receive abundance of grace means I got to get all the rest of what grace has to offer me once I'm saved. 
How do I do that? Humility. One, submit to God. Two, resist the devil. You can't sit there and continue to allow thoughts that go contrary to the word of God to run around in your head and then experience God's help. You're, you're going to counter everything God's going to do to help you with your mouth. If you, don't, if you don't resist Satan immediately when he tries to come against you in your thoughts and stuff by countering that with your mouth, guess what? You're going to keep speaking like we talked about. You're going to keep speaking the problem. God's trying to help you, but you keep cursing God's ability to help you by what you say. Because the Bible says death and life is in the power of the tongue, and that hasn't changed just because it's Old Testament. Right? James even talks about that. New Testament, James 3, your tongue is determining the course of nature. You're walking out with your life. So you've got to resist Satan when? Immediately. You've got to counter him immediately when he comes with these thoughts. Remember as a believer, when you have thoughts contrary to the word, they're not yours. You're a spirit. You're perfect in the eyes of God. You've been recreated in the image and likeness of God. Those thoughts are of the fleshly nature or the enemy. They're not yours as a spirit being born again. But you've got to counter them. So two, you've got to do what? Resist Satan. Three, you've got to draw near to God. You gotta have a desire to have a relationship with this God of yours. You can't make Christianity just going to church. I did my Christian duty for the week, and now I go about living my life. No, man. It's all about building a relationship with God 24/7. Not just when you come to church. And church should not be a religious duty. It should be you building that relationship with God, letting Him work on you, ironing sharpen iron. You know, some of you don't realize the people you dislike the most in church are actually the people that God put around you to help you the most. Give somebody a high five say, I really think he's talking about me now. <laughs> iron sharpens iron. Iron means one hard head up against another hard head trying to go at it. And if you'll listen and listen to God, he'll help sharpen you and get you out of that. Can I get a better amen? So, so realize, number three, what do you got to do? You got to draw near to God. You got to make your walk with God all about a relationship with him. Not coming, remember we said, not coming to God for what he can do for you. Coming because you want to know him. No human wants to have somebody build a relationship with them just for what they can get from them. There's no relationship in that. And many Christians treat God that way. No, you need to draw near to him. He loves you. He wants you to know him personally. So number three, we're talking about abundance of grace still. We already talked about these. You got to draw near to God. Number four, you got to cleanse your hands of willful sin. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. He's talking about if you're living a willful sin, doing stuff you know you shouldn't do, and you can walk away, walk away. Get, get rid of that stuff. Because living in sin still opens the door for Satan to ransack your life. You're not going to reign in life living in sin. And by the way, if you're living in sin, God ain't cursing you. God ain't spanking you. God ain't doing bad things to you. The Bible's clear. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he shall reap. New Testament, book of Galatians, chapter 6. You sow to the flesh, you reap corruption. You sow to the spirit, you reap life. So see, you can't just say, I'm saved by grace, man. It all just happens automatic. No, you keep sowing the flesh, man. You're going to keep getting corruption. So you do have to cleanse your hands of willful sin of things you know you can walk away from, shouldn't be doing, and you need to get out of your life. You should get your hands clean of that stuff, right? That was number four, by the way, if you're off, uh, off context with Number five, this is all how to humble yourself, according to James, to get more, more of God's grace in your life. This is how you do it. Number five, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Purify your hearts. Your heart is your inner man, and, and we taught you very clearly from the parable of the sower, how do you get this heart clear? How do you get this heart clean? I'll tell you how. You tell it. Don't let it be hardened soil. Get the rocks out of it. Get the thorns out of it. Now you're good ground. Now your heart's purified. Meaning what? Now as the seed of God's word goes in there, it's going to produce. Because listen, you could be a child of God, love God, come to church, serve God, serve in the house of God, worship God, sing the songs, hear the sermons. But if you're not good ground, that seed is not going to produce the life of God in you. So you got to recognize, as we've talked about, how to purify your heart and keep it clean. You don't clean your garden one time, you keep it clean. And we taught you already, uh, again, last week how to do that. Amen. So we've covered all that. That's the five things of humility to receive all of God's grace. Now that leads us into the second thing he said, and that's receiving abundance of God's righteousness. Go to Ephesians chapter 4, or receiving, excuse me, the gift of righteousness. It is a gift. Right standing with God's a gift. You didn't earn it. He gave it to you freely by your faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you something. Most Christians are not reigning in life because they truly lack revelation in their hearts, understanding in their hearts of who they now are in Christ Jesus. 
Oh, I'm going to help you. I've done your homework for you. Starting tonight, oh, I'm going to give you all kinds of verses on it. Instead of you having to be what you should anyway, digging them out for yourself in Scripture, I'm going to give you the top 20 in Christ Scriptures in the New Testament. Out of hundreds that your pastor has gone through for years. So you need to understand very clearly what we need to now do to receive the abundance of God's grace for us to rule and reign in this life. Watch this. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 17. Are you with me? 17. Paul said, this inspired by the Holy Spirit, this I say therefore and I testify in the Lord. I want you to really get your spiritual heart open and listen now and don't just read through these verses. I want you to listen very carefully to what he's saying. Because this is the key to receiving the gift of righteousness, making it your own. I know you already got it as a born-again believer, but remember, receive means you make it your own. You know, you know that you know this is so, all right? This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you, writing to believers in Ephesus, you should no longer walk. You should no longer live, in other words, as the rest of the Gentiles walk or live. Now, wait a minute. Automatically, what comes to most believers' minds when you think about not living like a Gentile? Gentile, by the way, is one who's not born again. They don't know God. What's the first thing that would come to mind when you think about not living like a Gentile? Yeah, see, not sinning. But you know what? That's not even what he's talking about here in this verse. He's not referring to not living like them in sin, which is true, you shouldn't. But that's not what he's focusing on. He's trying to focus on something of a change of a mindset. Right. Listen carefully. That's why, I want to, that's why I want you to pay attention to what he's saying. Don't just read over these verses and think you know them. Right. Even when you're reading them. Yep. Make sure you understand what's being said. I say therefore and testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Notice the focus. Notice the focus. Not in sin, in the futility of their mind. You should not think like a sinner. You should not think of yourself like a sinner thinks of themselves. The futility of their mind. The word futility means devoid of truth. God's word is truth. You're about to see at the end of these uh, verses here that the key that Paul's focusing on is your righteousness. Your right standing with God. I'll just let you know up front, that's the focus. I'm, I'm going to get to it, but I'm going to have to preach my way down to it. I want you to see this. So what is he saying? Once you're born again, you should no longer live in. You should not live in the same mindset of a, of a Gentile, one who doesn't know God, because they don't know what the scriptures teach about one that's born again. They're devoid of that truth. They don't have that truth in them because they're not born again. You should not walk as one who doesn't know God, devoid of the truth of God's word. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know the truth about who you are in Christ, i got a word for you. You're the reason. Not your pastor, not your spouse, not your kids, not your co-workers, not your family, not your upbringing. Well, my life is the way it is because the way I was raised. No, your life is the way it is because you don't know the truth about who you now are. You change families. In the natural, you're still associated with them, but you've been adopted by God. You now, you're now a child of God. You change families. You just don't know it. You don't have revelation of it. Remember, you got to receive, take as your own, this gift of righteousness and what it's done in you, who it's made you to be. See, Gentiles don't understand that because they don't have that gift in them. They don't have the gift of righteousness. Therefore, they're devoid of any such truth. And for you to try to explain that to an unbeliever, they look at you total, absolutely crazy. What are you talking about, man? What do you, what do you mean there's a new person on the inside of you? What do you mean? What do you mean you're not who you used to be? What do you mean you're a new creation? No, you're not. You're the same person. I can see you right here. You're the same person. See, they have that, and they can't even grasp that concept. Because again, not being born again, what does the Bible say? The word is foolishness to those who are perishing. Now, wait a minute, believer. You shouldn't be walking with the same old mindset you had before you came to Christ. You should not think of yourself the way you thought of yourself before you got born again. If you are still thinking of yourself in the way you always have, you're devoid of truth and that's your fault. Nobody else's. Because you got the truth right here. Yes. You got the truth. Right. Now the only other ones that would be devoid of truth is though that, those that don't have the word preached to them or don't have a Bible. Ladies and gentlemen, why do you think we're sending Bibles to Pakistan? 
You know, I know this to be true because it was true of my life for a period of time. Isn't it amazing how many Americans got multiple Bibles at home? And I mean, they got all the truth sitting right there they need to help them become victorious in life. And they're too busy with other stuff. That's right. You go to a foreign country like Pakistan where we're sending Bibles. The, why do you think these people are kissing these Bibles? Why do you think they're holding them dear to their heart? Why do you think they're so excited to get a Bible? I'll tell you why. They've never even, most of them, never even seen one. They've never, they've never heard the gospel preached. Where in the world do you think they're going to have seen a Bible from? And now all of a sudden they find out that this God who wants to know me is in this book. And this is how I can get to know this God and get to know who I am. Most of them have heard, maybe heard about the Bible and they know it's valuable. They don't have the money to go buy one. For you to give up nine bucks, 18 on and on and go, to give some, somebody a Bible in their hand, that's why it's so precious to them. May American Christians, once again, make this very precious in the sight of God in their life. Because this is God. This is God speaking to you. This ain't some book just to kind of read once in a while might give me some basic helpful truths. This right. revelation that will change your life. Amen. Christians should not be devoid of truth. Say it. Christians should not be devoid of truth. Say this, of who they are in Christ. Amen. If you are, that's your fault. It's nobody else's fault but your own. We're not putting you down. We're just telling you. That shouldn't be you. Right. Now, if you don't have a Bible, let us know. We'll get you one. Yeah. We'll get you a Bible. I don't have a Bible. Well, no problem. We'll get you a Bible. But I'm telling you, Christians should not be devoid of truth. Verse uh, 18. What are we talking about, Pastor? Training to reign. Yeah. We're still teaching how to train to reign. 18. They are devoid of truth. Watch. They have their understanding darkened. They don't understand the things of God. Why? They're alienated from the life of God. They're not born again. They're alienated. They're separated from the life of God. Why? Because they're not born again. Say, that's not me, though. See, he's given a comparison. He's not trying to tell you something you shouldn't know. It's obvious. They're alienated from God. They don't have the life of God in them. That's why they don't know these truths. But that shouldn't be us. They obviously walk devoid of truth. Look at verse 18. Because of the ignorance that is in them. What's ignorance? Ignorance means they don't know. Why do they not know? They aren't born again. But that's not us. That shouldn't be us. We should not be walking ignorant of what God says about us. God said through the prophet, my people, not the world's, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. New Testament, lack of knowledge of who you are now. Most Christians don't know who they are. They're still talking about themselves in the first person as a fleshly being. Come on. How about our series we just finished about how to develop your spirit, man, who you really are? What's the first key we taught you about developing your spirit, man? Does anybody remember? You must become aware that you are a spirit, spirit conscious. You're not a body. You're not a soul. You're a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. Think about how many times you refer to yourself in the first person, though, from the perspective of the flesh, the body. See, we shouldn't be doing that. That's what people who don't know God do because they don't know the truth about the word of God. Are you still here? So this is obvious in their life because of the ignorance that's in them. Watch this. They, what? Because of this, they have a blindness in their heart. Because of the blindness in their heart. They're not born again, so their hearts are going to be blind to that. All he's saying is, you shouldn't be like this. This is obviously what's going to happen in a Gentile's life because they don't know God. But ladies and gentlemen, what Paul's inspired by the Holy Spirit to the church at Ephesus to tell them is, you shouldn't, this should not be what I'm describing right now. Here's another way to say it in our, our language today. What Paul's saying right here is he's saying, what I'm describing to you should not be you. You should not be ignorant of these truths. You do not have blindness in your heart. You are not alienated from God. I like a better amen than that. Amen. Watch, verse 19. Because of this, they have now gone to a point of being past feeling. Who being past feeling? Past feeling? Past feeling? Yeah, the Greek language says it this way. Who have a lack of interest in the things of God? They don't, they don't have any interest in the things of God. It doesn't interest them. Wow. What interests a sinner? Sin. Yeah. What, what interests a sinner? The world. What interests a sinner? The flesh. I'm telling you, Paul's saying, this should not be you. <laughs> you. You should not be walking around as what interests you the most is what your flesh wants, what your sin wants, what your, what your sinful nature wants, what you desire in the natural, the way you think of yourself. That should, not what be, that should not be the focus of your interest in life anymore. 
What should interest you? God. What should interest you? Church. What should interest you? Prayer. What should interest you? The Word. What should interest you? Christian fellowship. What should interest you? Praying in the Holy Ghost. Am I going to get any good amens today? Amen. Give some a high five. Say, he's preaching way better than your amen today. They're, they're past feet. They have a lack of interest in these things. Why? Because they've obviously given themselves over to lewdness, to work all in cleanness with greediness. Verse 20, but you've not so learned Christ. So a lot of people read these verses and they're still thinking from a, listen, Christians read these verses and they're still seeing them from a carnal perspective. Because we're thinking of sin. Yeah, I shouldn't be living in sin like a, like a Gentile. That's not his focus. His focus isn't you shouldn't be living in sin like a Gentile. His focus is you should not be thinking like a Gentile thinks. You should not see yourself the way a Gentile sees themselves. They're devoid of truth because guess what? Their hearts are blinded. They're alienated from God. Therefore, they don't have any interest in the things of God. That's why they give themselves over to things that are not godly. That shouldn't be you. You shouldn't think that way. Are you still here? Watch this. He goes on. He's, he's about to culminate with us here in just a minute. Although he keeps on later on in the chapter. We don't have time to go through all of it, obviously. Watch this. Verse 20. But you've not so learned Christ. In other words, this is not what has been taught to you through what Christ the Anointed One did. Christ the Anointed One was not taught to you. Well, you get your ticket to heaven, man. Hope you make it through this life. Praise the Lord. See you when you get there. No, man. That's not what they taught. They taught the anointing is here to remove every burden, destroy every yoke from off of your life. Uh, you can literally have your life transformed and changed. If, if, if the anointing is at work in your life, no, it's not just something you pray about. It's the presence of God. But if the anointing of God's working in your life and it's removing burdens and destroying yokes, I have a word for you. You're reigning. Yes. You're reigning. Yes. A lot of Christians aren't, though. Mindset. Mindset. They're either not humble enough to receive all that God's grace has for them, or they're not doing what's necessary to get revelation of this gift of righteousness that's already in them. Are you still here? Yes. Am I making any sense to you at all? Yes. I done preach me happy. I'm already ready for lunch and it's only 1125. Amen. If, <laughs> if indeed you've, watch this, you've not learned Christ if what? If you've heard him. Now, now realistically, if you haven't heard the teachings of what the Bible teaches about, about who you are in Christ, sure you would like you know, understanding of that. Yeah, you'd have some ignorance there if you haven't ever been in a church that's taught you about your right standing with God. He's, he's making a recogni uh, recognition of that. Obviously, this isn't true of the church at Ephesus because he taught them. What he said, he said, if indeed you've heard him, you've not learned this same mentality as the Gentiles. Uh, if you've heard Jesus and you've been taught by him as the truth is what? As the truth is in Jesus. Now he's about to tell you what you and I should do to not be living with this same mentality as the Gentiles. What I love about the Bible is the Bible doesn't just tell you what you shouldn't do or what you're doing wrong. The Bible says, okay, here's how you fix it. Here's what you do to fix it. God never leaves you hanging out on a limb. Shouldn't be living that way. Shouldn't be doing this. Shouldn't be thinking that way. See you later. <laughs> okay. Well, how do I change it? Now, he fixed it. He'll show you how to get off the limb. Yes, he does. Verse 22. Now, I want you to pay very close attention. I'm going to read through the verses and I'm going to come back. That you put off. You put off. Underline it. You put off. See, I already lied. said I was going to read through the verses and come back. Hard for me to do. You... Nobody else. You put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That you put on the new man, that's the guy on the inside, which was created, listen carefully, watch this, uh, which was created according to God in what? True righteousness. What do we have to receive to reign? You have to receive revelation of all that grace has to offer. All that grace wants to do in your life. And you have to receive understanding of your right standing with God. True righteousness. Amen. That's what he's teaching you here. He's teaching you how to learn who you are in God. So you don't think like somebody who doesn't know God. You don't talk like somebody who doesn't know God. And you don't obviously live like somebody who doesn't know God. You reign in life. So you got to put on the new man, verse 24, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. 
Now, let's back up to verse 22. Ladies and gentlemen, I could have used another set of verses. What I love about these is it goes into more detail about what the Apostle Paul is being inspired by the Holy Spirit to say. But I'm going to give you a sister set of verses. Paul didn't keep preaching different stuff all the time. Paul kept preaching the same truths. He just said it in a different way. Holy Spirit knows exactly how to reach somebody. And so the Holy Spirit would obviously give him a little different wording, writing to the Colossians or writing to the Romans and to the Christians in Rome or whatever. He'd always give him a little different way to say it. This is very well known amongst Christians, but it's exactly what he just said in this context right here. And then I'm going to give you five things. Not going to overload. I'm just going to, I'm going to give you five things in these verses here of how you can get into this position of knowing who you are in Christ, your righteousness. But before I do that, I'm going to give you the coinciding verses. Because the minute I mention them, some of you may already be thinking about them. You're going to know them instantly. Same exact thing he's saying, but he doesn't go into much, as much detail as we're going to see in a minute. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Romans 12, 1 and 2 are the sister verses to Ephesians chapter 4, 22, 23, and 24. He says the exact same thing, just in a different way in Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, I'm quoting it now, Romans 12, 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, who's he talking to? Believers. I beseech you therefore, brethren, that you, who? You. Notice what he said here. You put off. In, in Ephesians here, he said, you put off. Romans 12, 1, you present your bodies. Oh, this is how you put off that old man. You present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, and do not be conformed to the world. Now he's, this is referring to verses 23 and 24. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Put on this new man. Verse 20, uh, Romans 12, 2. This is the coinciding verse. And do not be conformed to this world. Don't think like them. Don't see yourself like them. Everybody, again, just thinks conformity to the world. Sin. Don't sin. You know what causes that? Wrong mindset. Wrong mentality. You're still seeing yourself as a sinner. You're still talking to yourself as a sinner. You're not seeing who you are. The Bible says, awake to righteousness and sin not. Awake to your righteousness, who you are in Christ. And I'll tell you what, you're going to start walking away from sin. You parents, a little, little rabbit trail. I've, said, I've told you this many times. When, when you're raising your kids and you're telling your child, don't do that, what do I always tell you? Tell them why not to do it. Here's why you don't do that, and then finish with this. That's not who you are. What? That's not who you are. You're not a sinner. Now, if they know the Lord, they're not a sinner. What if they're a little kid yet? They haven't come to the knowledge of the truth. They're still gods. What if they are a sinner? Speak in faith. Declare by faith over them. Call those things that be not as though they were. So you parents got to learn this. You don't understand the power of this as a parent until you start doing it. If all you do is tell your parents, don't, 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 guess what you're going to do? They're going to do exactly what you said, don't, 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 don't do. The Bible says the strength of sin, I'm on a rabbit trail, so hold on a minute. The strength of sin is the law. In other words, what encourages more sin is law. Now, the law is not bad when it's understood through love, right? Like Jesus said, what's our focus now? You focus on walking in love, you'll fulfill all the law. Amen. Does a parent have the responsibility to tell the kids what not to do? Yes. But if all you ever do is say, don't do that, they're going to do it. You know why? Because you're coming to them like a law, not a parent. You're not trying to train them. Train a child in the way they shall go. Oh, come on, man. I'm going to do, it's probably going to happen on a Sunday afternoon. I'm going to do a special set of teachings for parents on parenting coming up. But, but listen to this. If you're, if you're addressing them like a law, you're the law now. You're not the parent. They want to rebel against you, the, the, nature, the sinful nature that's in them. The strength of the, strength of the sin uh, is the law. Right? I'll prove it to you. I had a friend of mine, a, a guy instructor actually at a Bible school that I was going to, very, very wonderful man of God, who was at the time studying and learning more about the understanding of our righteousness with God and grace and the law and all this kind of stuff on a balanced approach from Scripture. And the Lord said, I'm going to show you that if all you ever do is keep telling your kids, don't, 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 it's like taking the law and telling people to, you know, to not do all these things. Right. You're not telling them why not to do it. Right. And you're not telling them you shouldn't do these because this isn't who you are. You're just saying don't do that. 
That's all you're doing. You're just saying, don't do that. I'm going to prove to you the very truth of my scriptures that the law gives strength to sin. His son was having a birthday party. He was about eight or nine years old, I think, at the time. And he had a bunch of his buddies over. And they had the whole backyard set up, man, for this party. All kinds of games and stuff for him to do. Now, he didn't do this with the girls. because He just did it with the boys because it was his son's birthday party. So he calls all the little boys together. There's about 12 of them, 15, I think, something like that. He calls them all together over in the corner in the backyard. He says, hey, man. Man, you guys ready to have a good time today, man, celebrating so-and-so's birthday? Oh, yeah, yeah, Mr. Dudley, yeah, we're, we're ready to have a good time. Okay, praise the Lord. Listen, you can run, frolic, play, have fun, play all these games, do everything you want, but there's one thing that Mr. Dudley needs to talk to you about. Oh, okay, Mr. Dudley, what's that? Come here, boys. And like Donald Duck's nephews, they followed him over to the side of his house. And he brings him over to the side of the house, and out in a little, out in a little area of a gardener is a planter, a, a planter with a plant in it. He says, hey, any of you boys like to spit? Oh, yeah, yeah, we like to spit. So, okay, man, listen. He said, see this, see this grass out here? See this? Look how big this yard is. Spit till your heart's desire. Just spit anywhere you want. But you can't spit in that planter. Do not spit in that planter. Do you know why? That, now, this wasn't like why, why it's wrong. He just said, that's Mrs. Dudley's planter. Don't spit in that planter. Y'all got that? Don't spit in the planter. Yeah, we got it, Mr. Dudley. Don't spit in the planter. All right. His office in his, in his house where he studied at was just inside a window where he could watch that planter. The Lord showed him to do this. He went and sat in that office. They couldn't see him. He could see out through the blinds. They couldn't see him. He said, I'm telling you, 15 kids in less than 15 minutes, every single one of those boys came and spit in the planter. Every one of them. They would run over there and look around and take off and run somewhere else. They could have spit anywhere else in the yard, but no, they had to split, spit in the planter. Because the Lord said, you didn't explain why they shouldn't do it. You didn't tell them that's not you. You don't do that kind of stuff. You don't spit where you're not supposed to. So I'm just telling you, just like when you're raising kids, guess what? The strength of sin is the law. So if it's always don't, 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 instead of here's why you don't do that. Son, here's why you don't go play with the saw yourself. Let me bring up a picture on the internet of somebody who's lost a finger playing with a saw. Look what could happen if you, I'm serious, man. Or some way to make them understand, you know, take something else and cut it with that saw and say that could have been your finger. Is that, do you want that to be your finger? No, dad. That's why you don't play with the saw without dad around. Now, when it comes to doing stuff that's against the word, that's not right with the word, you say, here's why you don't do that. And I'll tell you what, you don't do that because you're what? That's not you. Amen. You're not a sinner. You love God in Jesus' name. You're a child of God. You keep imparting that into your kid and watch them. Watch them change. Amen. Could I get a better amen? amen? So, back to our scriptures. Very important to understand. He is telling us here about dealing with our bodies. Romans 12.1, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Romans 12.2, the, the coinciding verses, do not be conformed to the world. He's not talking about, again, looking at sin perspective. What's he talking about? Renewing your mind. Don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That doesn't mean renew your mind to everything that's a sin and don't do that. No, renew your mind to who you are as a child of God. And that's why I love these verses, because at the end of verse four, 24, he's telling you, you put on this new man as you come into the knowledge of true righteousness and holiness, who you now are. See, the Bible doesn't say you're going to be righteous. The Bible says you've been made the righteousness of God. You've been made that. Most Christians just don't know what they've been made. They're too focused on the external person. You know why they're still focused on the external person? I'm going to tell you why. Because they're not doing the five things I'm about to give you. Okay. Number one, what's the first thing we do, Pastor, to be able to get an understanding of who we are, not walk like the Gentiles, not be devoid of these kind of truths in the Scriptures? Number one, verse 22, you've got to put off your former conduct. Uh, the, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust, write it down this way. You've got to present your body to God. Present your bodies to God. I'm going to quote Romans 12, 1. Present your body to God, a living sacrifice. So what do you got to do? You got to give your, your body to God. This is putting off your former conduct. How do you put off your former conduct? I'll tell you how you put off your former conduct. You give your body to God. I don't have time to go there. But in uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, Paul talks about it relates to us not joining ourselves to a heart and all that stuff. But there's some powerful truths in there. It says that you and I belong to God. You've been purchased with the price. And it literally says your body is now the temple of God. And you're supposed to serve God with your body and your spirit. Yes. 
Now watch this, watch this. What, is it, what does it mean, Pastor, to present my body to God? Glad you asked. What's the body represent? Let's take what the body represents. The fleshly man. The physical body re re represents the fleshly man. He's saying, you got to you got to present this fleshly part of you to God. Wait a minute. Why should I present my body to God? Why should I present my body to God? Don't answer it. Why should I present my body to God? I'll tell you why. Because he gave you his. Jesus gave his body to you. Jesus gave his body to you by dying on a cross for you. He gave his body as a, sac as a living sacrifice for you. He gave you his body. You're now the body of Christ. If he gave his body to me, what should my reasonable service be? What should be my automatic response? Lord, I, hey, I'm going to give my body to you. Now, how do you give your body to God? I'll tell you how you give your body to God. You do it every day. Paul said, I die daily. Not I, the spirit man. I, the fleshly man. You know how you give your body to God? In your decisions. In your attitudes. In your focus. And in your time, especially. Amen. Meaning what? Quit making decisions based off your carnal reasoning. Quit living life out of your fleshly ways. Quit living life according to your own wants and desires. Start living life according to the Word of God. How should you treat people the way the Bible says, not the way your flesh wants to? Preaching better than your amen. And see, if you're not going to do this, you're not going to reign. Your flesh will reign over you. If you can't start with presenting your body to God, quit living the way you used to by allowing the flesh to determine what you do. How many Christians determine... Uh, let me back up. Let me back up. What is the biggest reasons... I've studied it. What is the biggest reasons that determine where Christians go to church? Question before I get to that. What's the most important part of your developing spiritually as a child of God? If you'll back up in Ephesians 4, guess what he was talking about before he got to this? The fivefold gifts that Jesus gave to the church. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, which are given to equip you. To equip you, give what you need for the work of ministry so that you're not going to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and be an immature baby Christian anymore. You're going to grow up and mature and reign in this life, praise the Lord. But you're not going to if you don't find your pastor. You're not going to reign in life if you don't find your pastor. The Bible says so, not me. So back to my question. So what if, if church, according to the book of Ephesians and many other verses, according to the book of Ephesians, if church is vital to me reigning in life and growing in God, right? If church is truly vital in that area, then what should determine where I go to church? Stop and think about what the average person does to decide where they go to church. And then ask yourself this question. Was that decision based on what the Bible says? Or was that decision based on what their flesh wanted? You ready for this? Number one thing that determines where Christians go to church, out of all things, number one, their kids. Proven statistics, 70 to 75% of most people in churches today determine where they go to church based on their kids. Based on kids' church. Children's church. Whether or not it has all the bells and whistles and lights and smoke and all the fancy things your kids in the natural want, because by the way, they're real spiritual, by the way, you know. And, and so, you know, obviously, some are. I'm not putting anybody down, but I'm just saying, you know, most kids, I'm talking about most kids, you know, I mean, you know what they're looking for? They're looking for what they got out there. Video and, you know, Splash and all this kind of stuff, right? That's what they're looking for. So, hey, their kids come back. Whoa, I love this church, man. This is great. Praise the Lord. We got free hot dogs. We got popcorn. We got to see a movie, man. We got to shout, run around. Glory to God, we come back to this church, mom and dad. Mom and dad may not have liked the service or really cared much for the pastor, but our kids want to come back to this church. Now, I'm going to tell you why parents do that. Don't get offended because I'm not talking to anybody directly. You know why they do that? Because they don't want to grow themselves. The parent don't. They don't want to grow themselves and therefore take up their responsibility as a parent. I have a word for you. I've said this for years. When, go back to Jesus' ministry. What, what if we really followed to the T Jesus' ministry? There would be no children's church. Not if you followed Jesus' ministry because there weren't any. Children's church is a modern day convenience for believers and their kids. 
Nothing wrong with it. I'm all for kids' church. I love kids' church. I love doing everything we can and still truce in kids' church. But I tell parents this all the time. We're not saying your kid may not ever learn something back there that you haven't taught them yet. But most of what they're learning should be a reinforcement of what you are already teaching them as a parent. Because God is not going to hold the church accountable for raising up your kids in the things of God. God's going to hold the parent accountable. We're not their parent. I love kids' church. Don't get mad. I love kids. Don't, don't, don't take me wrong. I love kids' church. We're going to keep having it. As long as we got teachers that are willing to help out and work in that area, I want to have it. I, I love having it. I think it's great. We know kids will come in there sometimes, you know, with their friends that their parents don't go to church. Maybe the only church they get. I, I'm all for kids' church, but I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you something. What does not determine where you go to church is whether your kids like the kids' church or not, or your youth like the youth group. You're not going to find that in the Bible. You're not going to find any place in the Bible where kids wanted to go. That determined, oh, well, this has got to be the place God wants us. All right, I've said it for years. If your kids are going to determine where you go to church, let them determine where you're going to eat every single meal every single day. Get ready to be very unhealthy. And eat lots of junk food that ain't good for you. Because you know where they're going to want to go to. Everywhere there's playground. Oh, we got to go to McDonald's. Oh, we got to go to Chick-fil-A. Oh, oh, we got to go to, we got to go to, you know, uh, Chuck E. Cheese's. We got whatever, you know what I'm saying? Where all the good food and fun stuff's at. Right? Where you run around and, you know, where you, if you don't, if you make the mistake of letting them feed first and then run around, they throw everything up. I guess they come back and eat more or something. Just trying to, just trying to shun off your little appetite for just a minute so you're listening to me. Amen. Should, sh I'm, I'm serious. What are you talking about right now, Pastor? I'm talking about you presenting your body as a living sacrifice. How do you do that? You quit making choices based on your flesh, your desires, your wants, your ways. You make them off the word. Nothing else. Nothing else. Are you still here? What's the second thing that determines where most people go to church? Does anybody know? Affiliation. Affiliation. My folks went there. I'm going to go there. I'm a Baptist. I'm always going to go to a Baptist. I'm a Methodist. I'm going to go to Methodist. I'm a Catholic. I'm okay. That's the second biggest reason what determines where people go to church. Nowhere found in Scripture. Nowhere in the Bible that says that's what determines where you go to church. It's not in there. It's not in the Bible. It's supposed to live by the Bible. That's not in the Bible. But yet the second biggest determination of where people go to church is by affiliation. None of these are biblical. None of them are. What's the third biggest reason? Everybody know I'm going to give you the top three. Convenience. Convenience. Oh, man, there's a church right down the street. Oh, okay. So that's where we go. The Bible said find a convenient church that, that you're somehow affiliated with of your past that your kids love going to. And there you go, man. You have found the hot spot for your spiritual growth as a child of God. Is that what the Bible says? You've been here long enough. What, is the, what does the Bible teach as to where you become a part of a church body? What does the Bible? Do you look at the church at all? Do you look at the church at all? Do you look at the people in the church at all? Do you look at the programs? The building? The facilities don't determine? By the way, Jesus never had a church building. Nothing wrong with them. We're going to have our own very soon. But nothing wrong with that. But I'm just telling you, he never had one. People get all hung up. We don't got a church building. Neither did Jesus. He did pretty good. What a determine, then what determines? Your shepherd does. Jesus said so. So you've got to find your shepherd. Read all of John 10 and quit just reading John 10, 10. Read all of it. Go start chapter, you know, start in verse 1 and read all the way down through the context and find out what he said. He said, you will know the one I've ordained for you when you hear his voice. And, a, and there, if you're a sheep, you want to follow Jesus. And the voice of a stranger, you will not follow. You don't base it on where your kids want to go. You don't base it, uh, n uh, number two, on affiliation by any kind of family or anything else. And number three, you don't base it on convenience. You base it on the word of God. I'm trying to teach you how to reign. You're not going to reign if you're making choices based on what your flesh wants to do. You understand? As long as you make decisions based on what you want and not what the Bible says, you're, 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 you're literally hindering your ability to reign in this life. You're not going to reign in this life. Thank you for all your amens. Number two, not only do you have to present your body as a living sacrifice, verse 22, do you understand that now? You've got to quit making decisions about relationships with those on your feelings. Well, they hurt my widow feelings. I, I'm going to treat them different. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Well, I don't like them. Well, the Word of God never said you had to like them. The Bible said you have to love them. Now, Christians think, well, yeah, I don't like them, so I'm just going to snub them. You're not loving them. You, should, you know what you ought to do? You ought to go out of your way. You want to see the power of God work in your life? Faith works through 
I'll tell you, oh, I'm about to challenge you with your flesh. Get ready, man. Hang on. Praise the Lord. Don't worry. Lunch is coming soon, so you're going to get out of here. I'm about to, oh, I'm about to mess with your flesh big time. I'm about to slap your flesh right upside the head. You ready for this? You ought to go out of your way to find the people, especially in the church of God, that you go to of people you don't like. That's who you should be going to every chance you get and loving on them. Yes. Tell them you appreciate them. Yes. Well, I like them. And you're going to allow that to turn in hatred and bitterness toward your heart if you're not careful. You want to learn to exercise love? You go to the unlovely. Jesus said, oh, man, come on, come on now. You just love those that love you. Sinners do the same. That, that's easy, man. Anybody can do that. You're supposed to love those that don't show love to you. Well, I don't want to do that. Then you don't want to walk in power-packed faith as an overcomer on this planet. Because the more you practice love, the more you're going to walk in love. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. People start coming up to you now that haven't come up to you before. <laughs> See, I know the way your mind thinks. See, you don't think I know that. <laughs> oh, they'll know I don't like them. <laughs> I don't know. I don't like them. Oh, no. I don't know. I don't like them. All right. So, so live in carnality the rest of your life or, or grow up as a spiritual believer and say, you know what? I got to tell you, I've really had some issues in my life with you, but I want you to know I am dealing with that now. I love you in Jesus' name. I don't want you mad at me over this, but I'm just being honest with you. There's a problem if we as Christians can't even be honest with each other. There's a real problem. You're never going to grow spiritually if you're going to try to hide everything and think you're never going to deal with it. Oh, gentlemen, don't miss our meeting today. You're not going to grow spiritually that way. Right? I'm telling you, the more you exercise love, the more your faith is going to work for you. Guaranteed. Uh, if, you, if you still have an issue with that, I have a question for you. All right. Did Jesus love the ones that crucified him? Yes. When, when would it be the hardest to love somebody like that? When would it be the hardest to love somebody like that? When they just drove nails through your hands and nails through your feet. When's it going to be the hardest to love them? They just physically drove nails through your hands and nails through your feet. And you're going to look down at the very ones that just drove nails into your hands and feet and mocked you for over three hours right. at Pilate's court, scourged you to the point of death, and you're going to look down on them and you're going to say, Forgive them, Father, because they don't know what they're doing. Tell somebody, I can do that. You know why? Because the love of God's in you. Most Christians aren't experiencing the power of their faith working because they're hiding the love of God in them. They're not releasing it. Love's worthless if it's not acted on. It's worthless. Love's worthless. What good is it if it's not acted on? You know what? That'd be like somebody coming up to me and say, Pastor, God put it on my heart, man. I know it's your birthday. I'm going to give you a 67 Fastback Mustang that I bought for you. Wow, okay, that's nice. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Glory to God. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to let it sit in the parking lot. I'm never going to drive it. I'm just going to let it sit there. Not even going to look at it. I'm not going to pay attention to it. I'm not going to ever drive it. What was the car made to do? Drive. I'm not going to do that. Well, why'd you give it to him? Right. Why'd you receive it? Would be more better question to ask. Yeah. Why would you receive something you're not going to use? Yeah. Don't receive the love of God and not use it. I'll get off of that and I'll move on. Because I'm running out of time. Verse 22 then. What's the first thing I ought to do? I ought to present your body as a living sacrifice. Hope I made my point. I could preach on this stuff for about three or four months, man. But I've got to move on. Number two, the second thing you've got to do is you've got to do what? I want to say it this way because this is the way it says it in the Greek. You must continually renew your mind. Continually. You must continually renew your mind to the new man on the inside. You must continually renew your mind to the new man on the inside. This new righteous man that he talks about in verse 24. You've got to continually do that. It's not an occasional thing. It's not something you do once in a while or every now and then. You've got to do it all the time. You've got to consistently renew your mind. The number one thing, believer, listen to me, the number one thing, believer, you need to be renewing your mind to constantly is who you are in Christ. True righteousness. You're right standing with God. That's how you reign. How are you going to reign if you don't know who you are? How are you going to reign? I'm talking revelation in your heart, not your head, not knowing this stuff in your head. I'm talking about that's why receive means get it in your heart. 
Receive the gift of righteousness. You'll reign in life. Receive it. You've got to take it as your own. You've got to get it in your heart. A lot of Christians know in their head, yeah, I'm born again. I'm one with God. I'm an heir of God. I'm a joiner with Jesus. But that ain't revelation in their hearts. Because they don't take time to do what he said. You got to notice this. I want, you, I want you to read it there in verse 23. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. I like the way he words it here better than Romans 12 too. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You know what it means? Be continually renewed in your mind to who you are as a spirit being. Get your mind renewed to who you are as a spirit. Not a body. Not a soul. Who you truly are is right with God. That's the spirit man on the inside. True righteousness is the guy that's right on the inside. You understand what righteousness means? Righteousness means God looks at you as if you never sinned. You know why he can do that? He's not making it up. You know why he can do that? Oh, man, I'm preaching my message tonight. You know why he can do that? Because you're a new creation. Yes. You know what the word means in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, new creation? Something that never existed before. God didn't make you over on the inside. That's right. He didn't leave the old spirit, just kind of clean it out and put some new stuff in it. He removed it. That's hard, that's hard for us to fathom. But that's what the Bible says. He breathed in you brand new life. The word new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says something that never existed before. If your spirit who's now perfect, and you'll see this, your spirit who's now perfect and right in the sight of God is brand new, have you, the new you, the new spirit man, have you ever sinned? Oh, see, that's tough for you to even fathom. Have you ever sinned? Nope. My spirit man is brand new. He's never sinned. Oh, see, man, you just, I, I'll tell you what, if you've ever been on a ranch, I used to work on one, and you come up to, obviously, you, we'd build these, you know, these uh, crosswalk, you know, these uh, gate things, you know, cows can't walk over, you know, something. You'd put up a new one, and the cows would show up and see it for the first time, they're like, oh. <laughs> They'd go up and sniff it, jump back, oh. That's what y'all are looking at right now. Oh, no, no, I've sinned. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. Your flesh has, your spirit never has and never will. If your spirit sins, you got to be born again, again, or you can't go to heaven. No sin can reside in the presence of God. Wait a minute. Holy Spirit lives in you. He can't reside in you where there's sin. I'll get on it tonight. Sorry I even brought it up. Now some of you are going to be chewing on that all during lunch. Well, I don't know if I believe that. Bless God. Well, don't believe it because I said it. Go look at it for yourself. The reason he can treat you is if you never sin, because the new man on the inside has not. You are now, you've been made in the righteousness of God. Amen. You were made yes. the righteousness. You were made the righteousness. Yes. That which is made righteous with God is not sin. Amen. All right, all right, all right. Because I can't get off it. Some of you are still staring at me funny. You're going to make me go into overtime now if you keep messing with me like this. I'm an old sinner saved by grace. True or not true? How can you still be an old sinner and be saved by grace at the same time? If you're still an old sinner, you can't go to heaven. There are going to be no sinners in heaven. Heaven, that is the reason Jesus had to die. He had to cleanse you of your sin. In the Old Testament, he covered it. In the New Testament, he obliterated it and wiped it away. Amen. Is not all that true? Yes. Then you, spirit man, have not sinned. Because your spirit's perfect. Your spirit ain't going to be any more perfect when you step into heaven than you are right now. Amen. What's hindering you? Your, your soul and your body. Are you still here? I got to go on. You, you keep challenging me like that, Josh. Man, I got to preach longer, buddy. You're, if I go long today and you're going to be real hungry, you all blame Joshua afterwards. Okay? I'm teasing because I know Joshua will take it and not get mad at me. You know what? I'm going to wrap up here because for the sake of time, I cannot press through these last three. I'm going to finish them up tonight. I would do an injustice to try to do that. But I'll give you a reading assignment if you want to do it during, during this afternoon. It's Ephesians chapter 4, 5, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 18. Ephesians 5, verses 8 through 18. Now, if you're taking notes, you can write them down. I'll give you these five things, and then we'll, we'll look at them tonight. You don't want to miss this. So, 
to reign in life, I got to do what? I got to make my own. All that grace has to offer, right? Including, including the grace he wants to add to my life. I'm back to Romans 5, 17. How do you reign in life? Receive abundance of grace. Take as your own everything grace has to give to you, including obviously what grace teaches us now. Two, you got to take as your own what? An understanding of who you are. True righteousness. How do you do that? One, you got to give your body to the Lord. Because if you're going to let your flesh keep calling the shots and making your decisions, you're not going to renew your mind. You're not going to get these truths in your heart. Two, you got to be continually renewed to the new man within. And I'll guarantee you, I can see by the looks on your faces that God can look on you as one who hasn't sinned. That needs to be happening more for all of us. He could not look upon you that way if it was not true. In the Old Testament, the only reason he could look at those who had sinned and act as if they hadn't was because the blood was an atonement, a covering. Your, your sin did not get atoned. Your sin got removed. You got redeemed. There's a difference. All right, number three, you do not fellowship with darkness. You do not fellowship with darkness. You need to understand this. You need to let me explain it to you tonight. I don't have time now. But you don't want to fellowship with darkness. That's participating and doing things that you know you shouldn't do. Obviously, that's going to do nothing more than continue to cloud your view of what God's Word says. Amen. Are you still here? Yes. Four. This is a biggie. It's bolded in my, in my five points because it's the biggest problem for most believers today. Redeem your time. Redeem your time. See the verses I gave you? 5, 18, 8 through 18. He just keeps going on. It wasn't written in chapter and verse. He goes on to talk about what he's defining about how you continue to do this stuff. You got to redeem your time. Five, you got to stay full of the Holy Spirit. You got to stay full of the Holy Spirit. And you'll see that tonight in those verses. Amen? amen. I said amen. amen. Then, when I finish that tonight. We're going to get into a, a little two-part deal. I'm going to give you the top 20 in Christ verses in all the scriptures. There's 190 plus verses. Been through all of them many t multiple times. There's 190 plus verses in the New Testament that talk about who you are because of the righteousness God gave you. Oh, I got to look up all 190. Now, it wouldn't hurt you to do that. You shouldn't just take the 20 I give you, but I'm going to give you the hottest 20 of, of the 190 of stuff you need to be renewing your mind to. What's the most important thing for me to be renewing my mind to every day? Who you are in Christ. You've got to get this picture of this new guy on the inside. Stand your feet. Praise the Lord. This concludes another message from the ministry of Reverend Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. If you would like to find out more about us or contact Pastor Baker to have him as a guest speaker, just visit us on the web at cffchurch.com. That's cffchurch.com. You will also find many great resources that will help you further your walk with God. You can also contact our ministry by phone at 817-491-0624. That's 817-491-0624.